I feel very warmly welcome. Um, let me begin by uh, thanking Professor uh, Balian and also Maharashtra National Law University, as well as the, the team of the Indian Review of International Arbitration for the kind invitation and for hosting me uh, today. So um, I believe uh, today's events uh, is going to address a set of very important um, topics in the, the fast evolving area of investment law and investment arbitration. And so I'm delighted to participate, to share with you some reflections on the use and sometimes the misuse of uh, procedural applications in investment arbitration. So I like to start lectures by giving you all um, a very simple overview of what I'm going to talk about. It doesn't mean you have to leave after two or three minutes, but I simply like going um, through the main ideas of the, the paper and its lecture in, in simple terms, in simple words, and in just two or three minutes. So the very basic idea is that delays are becoming a common phenomenon in investment arbitration. And that's something serious because it is challenging the conventional belief that it's a time effective mode of dispute resolution. Uh, these delays, essentially stemming from interim procedural applications, are known to arise due to the different interests and types of stakeholders involved within the process of investment arbitration. Now, we'll see what these delays are, but th the very important message is that such delays can uh, particularly become a cause of concern for investment arbitration as they, they do have impacts beyond the parties involved. So for these reasons, it's very important to delineate the narrow distinction between legitimate interim applications and the rest, which for now I can call um, delay tactics that may be employed by parties to uh, prolong arbitration proceedings. So in a nutshell, this lecture um, aims at doing something simple but important. The lecture uh, provides an empirical analysis of such arbitration proceedings to call out the types, uh, the nature, the effects um, of delay tactics in investment proceedings. And you'll see that the lecture focuses on three types of applications that seem to play an increasing role in investment arbitration, uh, namely applications for security for costs, that would be the number one, um, applications for disclosure of third party funding, number two, and uh, number three, the objections of manifest lack of legal merit of claims. So, in order to start, I'll try to give you a bit of background as for what's happening in investment arbitration and why there is increasing discussion on uh, delays and various tactics. Um, let me start with some background as for the importance and practice of procedural applications in investment arbitration. Um, as you would all know, investment arbitration is generally preferred owing to the notion that it's a quicker dispute resolution process than knocking on the doors of domestic courts. However, the timeline of an investment arbitration, that means from the date of notice of arbitration until the final annulment or award rendered by the tribunal is 
let's say, long, lengthy, and involves a long, drawn-out battle between parties. In fact, what we observe is that the reality of proceedings reveals a complex picture, one that is increasingly characterized by various delays and more and more delays of all kinds. So there is a simple question at this stage, which is why are there delays? And, and I would say, why are there more and more delays? Well, I believe that a fundamental reason is the fact that the different parties, so uh, in the case of investment arbitration, we, we mean the certain states and the private investor or investors, they have different interests, they have different approaches, and they have different methods to approach the um, resolution of dispute existing between them. And this is further complicated by the conflicting interests of many other additional stakeholders within the process, such as non-governmental organizations or NGOs, or the appearing councils. In short, I would say that while the private investor and their lawyers would want to win the case, the NGO would focus on participation within the process to ensure that important uh, public uh, affecting aspects of the disputes are highlighted, understood, and not given a go by by either party. On the other hand, or at the same time, the state, the sovereign state, would be concerned with safeguarding its reputation and maintaining a consistent stance throughout um, the proceedings. So if you think about the different interests of the states, the NGOs, the third parties, and the investor, you understand that they are not the same, and this can inevitably lead to conflicts in the form of a delay in the proceedings, which would generally involve different mechanisms employed by each of these stakeholders to stall or buy time to obtain a favorable judgment in the long run. So we understand why there, there got to be delays and why these delays are going to be uh, uh, very diverse because it's just a reflection of the great diversity of the main stakeholders in the process of arbitration. Now, we can look into the details and try to answer the logical next question, which I formulate like this. Uh, what's the technical and the procedural form taken by these delays? So what are these delays from the purely um, legal aspect or the purely procedural perspective? The short answer is it's all about procedural applications. It's all about this. Investment arbitration proceedings generally involve parties uh, filing procedural applications, which are decided upon by the tribunal through a procedural order. Now, the importance and repercussions of delays uh, facilitated by such applications are being increasingly brought to light due to the COVID pandemic, which has led to parties being unable to, dis to discharge existing obligations or promise uh, new ones. So just to give a recent example, I think many of you might have heard about the case Orlandini Agreda versus Bolivia. So it's a good example because in, in this dispute, the respondent state, Bolivia, requested for the suspension of the time limit to submit its statement of defense on the grounds of force majeure stemming from the pandemic. And in, in its decision, while rejecting this application, the tribunal noted that since November 2019, the respondent had requested three extensions 
for the filing of its written briefs, making another extension um, impossible. So um, it's within this backdrop that um, uh, my ongoing research, which I'm presenting today, uh, basically presents an empirical study of the causes, the types and effects of delays on and within investment arbitration proceedings. To this end, the research analyzes and covers reported investment arbitration cases based on the type and effects of the delays occurring during these proceedings. On the one hand, there are some well-known tactics which uh, will not be discussed in detail today. Uh, they are they are common, they are well known, so I can just mention them uh, briefly. So these common delay tactics used for a long time uh, consist, for instance, of challenging the jurisdiction of the tribunal and or the legality of the investments. It can also be uh, seeking an anti-arbitration injunction or filing disqualification uh, challenges against arbitrators. Or to some extent, one can also consider that um, the offer to settle uh, disputes can potentially be another delay tactics. But all in all, these few uh, tactics which I've just mentioned are very well known. I don't think there is much to be said that, that would be new on the question of the legality of the investments or the challenge of the jurisdiction of the tribunal. On the other hand, what I find interesting when we look at the practice is that there is an increasing use of some applications that cause delays. And uh, after reviewing um, hundreds of cases, I observed that there is an increasing use of uh, three specific applications, which I'm going to focus on. I've identified awards that have been significantly delayed and typically include all or either one of the following reasons for the delay. So security for costs and or third, third party funding disclosure application and or um, the exit rule 41.5 applications. So in this respect, I believe that the problem of delays uh, in investment arbitration is only on the rise and, and both the parties and the tribunal should closely pay attention to such new tactics to ensure speedy and effective delivery of, of justice. So I'll discuss um, these three uh, emerging um, delays or cause of delays. Uh, and I'll start uh, with the security for costs um, in investment arbitration and demonstrate how the same may be used to delay proceedings. And later on, I'll discuss the case of third party funding applications. And, and then uh, in, in the third part, I will eventually highlight the contentious summary procedure laid down within the rule 41.5 um, exceed uh, rules, explaining how the, the so-called manifest lack of legal merit is misused or can be misused by parties to delay proceedings. So let me start with um, the first um, element. So, uh, oh, sorry, before that, I want to share just a bit of, of my empirical survey. Okay, I think that in terms of method and for you all to understand what, what's been done and what are my essential sources, I should share a few more things uh, with you. So let me just add a few more comments on the, on the problems of delay in investment arbitration. Um, here I'll simply highlight some, some studies that were published recently by some other experts, which I believe to be very important. Um, First, if you look at the exceed itself, the exceed um, and and um, and its uh, frequent statistics, 
uh, you'll see that the average length of an investment treaty dispute is three years and seven months. So that gives an idea of the, the duration of an investment um, dispute. But of course, there are some other studies with different point of view or different methodology. And I just want to, to highlight the study published in, yeah, it was 2020 by uh, Susan Frank, who notes that the average length of investment treaty disputes is 40 months. And, and this colleague uh, observes that the uh, SCC, so the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce investment arbitrations lead to durations which are shorter uh, because it's only 21, 21 months from the date of registration to the final award. So I exceed um, Susan Frank, they have other studies, but for me, what's interesting to, to highlight at this stage is that the problem with these studies is that they may fail to draw clear distinctions between disputes which are settled, disputes which result in consent awards, disputes where proceedings are suspended, um, disputes which result in annulment proceedings, and even disputes which result in fresh proceedings. So. A clear demarcation is necessary to objectively assess the time taken in investment arbitration proceedings with all possible outcomes. So for this reason, um, what, what I'm using is the idea that there is a four-year period. The four-year period is an average that um, can be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and when you look at these studies and a few others, you realize that some of these studies may also fail to capture post award proceedings, which is something I want to leave aside. But for instance, that can be important because um, even though the, the famous UCOS dispute resulted in a 2014 final award, the most recent post award order is an order of the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia uh, dated November 2020, so nine years after the proceeding started. So it's not very clear how long uh, an investment case can be expected to last, but you see some disagreements or some difficulties to calculate what could be, what would be an average duration. But in my view, this further highlights the problem posed by delays. Why are delays a problem in this respect? Well, delays in investment arbitration are a problem because of the financial costs to all parties involved. Cost is, is the key word here. For a foreign investor, a pending dispute would result in business costs and, and the costs of hiring a counsel. For a host state with a dedicated state council, the significant cost may be the cost of the proceedings itself. So while delays can be expected, the duration of delays is as unpredictable as the type of disputes. And this is why there is a problem. For example, here, you see the case uh, Casado versus uh, Chile. Um, we know that a dispute may be delayed um, when an arbitrator challenge is successful. Uh, that's the example given by this uh, Casado versus Chile, which is the longest dispute in the history of the exit, uh, with an annulment decision that was made only in 2020. So, in a nutshell, this dispute, this uh, Casado Chile dispute, is interesting because it involved challenges before Chile courts, arbitrator challenges, requests for revision of the award and annulment proceedings. It involved almost all the kind of applications you can think about in the context of investment arbitration. And so as a result, even though the hearings on jurisdiction and merits uh, were, were held in, in early 2000, in 2003 exactly, um, uh, the further hearing following a request from the respondent for uh, new written submissions 
had to be held in uh, 2007. And as I said, the annulment decision was only made in 2020. So this case is a very good example of the number and the diversity of uh, applications that can be made, and a very good example of how long an investment arbitration uh, uh, can can become. So that's something totally uh, counterproductive. Now, looking at the awards um, rendered in 2020 only, you have a summary here. I can only show you a sample of the survey. Okay, there are too many cases, so it's only a snapshot. We have one, two, three, four, five cases. Um, I want to highlight uh, the, the the key lessons of the survey before to move into the the analysis. So, looking at the award rendered in 2020 only, right? The most time-consuming stages leading to lengthy ISDS proceedings are the well-known questions of appointment of the tribunal members, discovery of document production, objections to jurisdiction, and the issuance of awards. But, but new tactics are emerging. And the new tactics that are emerging are based on applications for security of cost, disclosure of third-party funding. Um, by this, I mean, um, uh, so I mean that third party funding disclosure may be a delay tactic used by a state, although of course, third party funding disclosure should not be understood as being automatically a tactic to delay proceedings. And then three, the exceed rule 41, uh, five applications, because in practice, it is states uh, who make requests through applications for uh, bifurcation of uh, proceedings. So I've been working with uh, all this uh, 2020 award. It's just a, a snapshot. But in fact, in my survey, you find the same trends for 2019, 2018. So there is really something happening, which is uh, very, very interesting. So now let's dive into the, the technical details, the legal details, and, and look at each of these three new um, uh, delay tactics. I'll start with uh, the application for security for costs. I don't come back to the numbers again, uh, but just for 2020, you will find many, many disputes that have seen this kind of applications, right? So it's, it's factually something that's becoming important. So Security for costs of uh, arbitration is an interim step uh, which can be submitted by the respondent of a claim. So the object of, of such a motion is to ensure that the complainant is able to afford to pay a future payment of adverse costs. And this can include, and are not really limited to, lawyers' fees, uh, tribunal fees, as well as um, administrative costs. And, and so uh, the object is to ensure that the complainant is able to afford to pay uh, a future payment of adverse costs uh, levied on him or her if the lawsuit is obtained by the respondent. Where an appeal is submitted by a respondent and the arbitral tribunal issues the order for security, the applicant must make the payment agreed by the tribunal into an escrow account or, or any other form of a security agreement. Security for costs is important, but sometimes mistaken with security for claims. And that should not be done because the letter alludes to the security posted for the substantive claims in the arbitration, uh, which is quite different, and it's not what I'm discussing here. So if um, the claimant does not agree, then either the proceedings can be stayed or the claim can be denied. Security of costs of international arbitration is centered around um, two restricting restricting policies. 
On the one hand, since it can stifle a genuine claim if the claimant is in a reduced cash flow position, it can be an obstruction against the claimant's access to justice, to arbitral justice. And on the other side, denying an order and permitting an insolvent claimant to continue leaves the respondent in danger of being unwilling to impose a future award of costs against the claimant should the respondent defeat the claim. Consequently, you see that a balance between the conflicting policies must be struck. And in, in practice, the balance has been the balance has, the balance has been uh, enunciated based on I think two uh, fundamental grounds: urgency and sales risk of harm to the applicant. And so here it's important to uh, to look at at a number of um, other um, uh, details in this respect. Um, a primary observation that needs highlighting is a clear and with a consistent increase in the number of interim security for costs applications filed during investment arbitration proceedings. Interestingly, this increase is also visible within a single proceeding with at least one case requesting for more than one interim measure. That's meaningful. So while this indicates the growing preference toward the use of such applications in investment arbitration, I think it would be unfair to view this in isolation in light of the rising number of investment treaty disputes worldwide. We have to keep that in mind. Statistically, there is an increase in the number of applications. That is something important and got to be discussed. But it's also due to the fact that there is an increase in the number of investment disputes. Okay, so that's something I take into account in, um, in my research and my reflection to also uh, uh, insist on the fact that uh, the, the increase in a number of procedural applications cannot be read in itself as a kind of emergency or panic um, invading investment arbitration and leading to the to the uh, to a clear cut conclusion that there would be uh, automatically a uh, massive increase in in terms of uh, the duration of the proceedings. It's a bit more subtle. Okay, so that's a variable I mentioned here, and I'll come back on this in a, in a, a little later. So the basic point is that uh, while it cannot um, mathematically be stated that there is a proportionate increase in applications as opposed to those filed in a previous decade, what can for sure be concluded is that stakeholders within the process, notably respondent states, are uh, warrior of claims filed against them and they seek immediate protection to prevent frivolous claims by claimants unwilling to discharge their obligations in the event of adverse awards. I think that's the, the big takeaway. And this uh, variness may also be attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic for the past you know, 18 months that has forced states to undertake extensive analysis to protect economic and, and financial interests as a priority. So security for costs applications naturally have the effect of increasing the duration of arbitral proceedings, as is evident from the last, uh, from the, the survey I've conducted. Um, which suggests that they, they lead to um, a, a, an extension of the procedure by an average of six months. I can come back on the data a little later. Now, on top of that, most of them have been denied by tribunals. That also has to be uh, highlighted. 
there are applications, but many of them are denied. So uh, this is where the invocation of such applications becomes interesting and demands further study, because it has to be seen um, how motivated these are to the true cause of, of them being filed and the extent to which these are merely delay tactics, or if they are um, potentially genuine applications that lead to delays in the proceedings. And the two are slightly different, are quite different. Well, in any case, um, the, the big idea I think we have demonstrated here is that um, the provisions of security for costs do have the potential to be misused. And statistically, we see more and more of them in investment arbitration. Now, I move to the next type of application, which are the application for disclosure of third party funding. So here too, there would be a lot to be said about this type of applications. Sorry, I don't have the time to discuss all the aspects of this type of applications, but in, in a nutshell, if you're not familiar with, with this kind of applications. Um, I'll, I'd like to highlight the fact that uh, third-party funding, let me say TPF, has gained considerable traction over the past years, uh, bo both before courts in the, con the context of litigation, but also increasingly arbitration. Um, it, although third-party funding has recently assumed this center stage in the arbitral discourse, its impacts and benefits have demonstrated that it's here to stay. Yeah, there are many studies um, on this question. I'll just refer here to the excellent work done by Professor Brekoulakis and Catherine Rogers on third-party funding. Um, but so in a nutshell, third-party funding, TPF refers to the process by which an um, unrelated party finances a dispute in exchange for parts of a favorable award delivered by the tribunal. I think it's a fair definition. Now, since these funders may facilitate conflicts of interest with the parties or the tribunal, commercial and investment arbitration advocate for its full disclosure by the party receiving such funding and applications for such disclosure are separate and thus there is a well-funded apprehension that this becomes a delay tactic presented before investment tribunals, before SDS. And it's interesting because uh, a modest number of investment uh, tribunals have imposed some form of disclosure on TPF. So, for instance, in the case and uh, the dispute Eurogas um, versus Slovak Republic it was an exit uh, dispute. The exit tribunal ordered the claimants to reveal the identity of their outside funder, despite the fact that they had earlier declared that their claim was sponsored by an outside uh, funder. Um, you also have a UN central tribunal. Um, decision on that in the case um, South American Silver versus Bolivia. In this case, the UN Central Tribunal ordered the claimant to uh, reveal the identity of its uh, financier. Um, uh, and that was interesting in, in this uh, case. A third example is the case of uh, Tikaret versus Turkmenistan. You have the details here. Because in the Tikaret case, the exit tribunal um, uh, went even further uh, and directed claimants to disclose if their claim was supported by an outside party, and if so, the identity of the funder and the conditions of the financing agreement. So, you know, it's a few cases. Um, uh, and what's interesting is that if these tribunals are of any indication, then the existence or the existing absence of regulation does not ensure 
that third-party funding will remain confidential. In fact, disclosure of TPF uh, applications can create space for respondent states to engage in trivial legal maneuvering, consequently delaying the proceedings and increasing the costs of the funded party. So if a party becomes aware of the other party's litigation's budget, an incentive might be created to bring um, dilatory requests or arguments simply to exhaust that budget before the case is over. This is something that's been called guerrilla tactics, uh, whether before courts or increasingly before investment tribunals. And so guerrilla tactics are a problem because they could divert away from the actual issues with respondents attempting to pierce uh, numerous layers of the corporate curtain in order to maximize uh, their delay techniques. So it's been claimed that disclosure may lead to adverse decisions regarding cost allocation and security uh, for cost. Yet, uh, there have been no cases so far to suggest that claimants have to uh, bear adverse costs due to the disclosure of third-party funding. That's uh, something very uh, important too. Now, I think I come to the, sorry, to the third type of um, application, which is the objection of manifest lack of legal merit of claims. Um, so as a brief background here, uh, what, what I believe important to quickly explain is that objections of manifest lack of legal merit basically allow claims to be dismissed early in the process before they unnecessarily consume the party's resources. All right, so, so here, I focus on the rule 41.5 of ICID arbitration rules, which, um, which in a nutshell empowers tribunals to decide on uh, preliminary objections, alleging claims um, are manifestly without legal merit. So uh, the exceed rule 41, uh, fifth paragraph is interesting. Uh, because it's been the most frequently resorted uh, to rule and summary procedure, and it's been invoked 34 times in all the cases I have collected in my survey. Um, now, of course, it's not just um, uh, it's not just um, the the exceed here that's relevant. It's not just the article. Uh, 41, because um, there are, in fact, a number of other rules that can be applied in the context of investment arbitration. So we have a number of, uh, I would say, equivalent, if I may, to, to make it simple. Let's say that there are similar provisions that are present in other arbitral rules, like, uh, for instance, the article, the rule 39 of the SEC rules which allows tribunals to determine certain issues of fact or law in a summary procedure at the request of either of the parties. You can also look at the ICC, where you, you get the, the Article 22 of the ICC rules, which is another example of an arbitral rule that allows for the uh, determination, the expeditious determination of um, manifestly unmeritorious claims, provided that uh, it is not contrary to the parties' agreement. And again, uh, the Singapore and the Hong Kong uh, rules that uh, you see here. So for the sake of the presentation, I'll focus on the exit, which also makes sense because the exit rules are far more often applied in investment arbitration than all these other rules I've mentioned. But I think it's important to uh, stress the fact that the exceed 
um, rule 41.5 is not unique and that you'll find many other equivalent. So the, um, the summary procedure laid down in article in rule in rule 41.5 uh, enable parties to the disputes with um, an opportunity to get rid of unmeritorious and abusive claims quickly at uh, an initial phase of the uh, arbitral proceedings. In principle, this procedure saves both time and cost while answering due process to the parties. So the Rule 41.5 uh, is interesting, but was only introduced by amendment in 2006 um, by the exit. Interestingly, uh, the rule was really brought to life uh, in, in some awards only in 2010. It's in 2010 that the rule 41.5 has been brought to life by the awards of the tribunals in Global Trading versus Ukraine and RSM versus Grenada. So I'll come back on that. But, but here we have uh, a 10 years practice only with respect to this type of, of application that may result into some uh, delays. Um, but back to the Rule 41.5, um, it's important to understand that it permits both uh, merit and jurisdictional uh, based objections okay? that can be used in the two contexts. Now, the consequence is that uh, the Rule 41.5 has been uh, widely applied over the past 10 years. And the, the plethora of, of the applications uh, is also important from the research point of view because it provides sufficient basis to indicate that there is a majority of developing countries that are uh, handling this delay. Again, I cannot show you the full survey. Uh, you have to trust me on that or wait for the paper to be published. But, you know, I got all the data and, and that's in, important to look at the the, the type of responding parties, and to highlight that it's essentially developing countries. Now, uh, <clears throat> the consistency and frequency of invocation of these applications stem from party conception that summary procedures will add to inherent um, cost and time efficiency by dismissing unnecessary claims filed before tribunals. So, for developing countries, therefore, uh, preventing unnecessary financial strains assumes priority, and thus these applications may prove useful. However, the trend that I'm highlighting also indicates the exact opposite um, than what it is intended, with most applications being dismissed by tribunals. So. Here again, there'll be a lot of things to discuss. Let me just highlight the major reasons. The major reasons for this are twofold. First, uh, the term manifest lack of legal merit requires satisfaction of a higher threshold. And second, lawyers generally practicing in this field uh, that are aware of this inherent subjectivity are thus more incentivized to utilize these applications to delay proceedings. So the effectiveness of the Rule 41.5 is limited by the established high standard, uh, the reluctance of tribunals to give a conclusion in summary proceedings, and, and also the likelihood that the claimant could adjust the factual and legal arguments during the course of the proceedings. These are defects, and these defects allow parties to invoke the Rule 41.5 without um, a genuine basis to disrupt and delay the proceedings and increase the wastage of parties' financial resources, making it difficult for them to avail justice. 
Nevertheless, until now, if I if I return to the facts and the statistics, um, until now, only eight of 34 cases have rendered full and partial dismissal, which makes it clear that persistent abuse of this rule is absent in the present time or is not so important. Well, on top of that, parties to a dispute should be aware of the fact that the dismissal standard for an objection is high and, and parties should remain realistic about their preliminary objections. Now, I want to come back to the historical uh, evolution of this Rule 41.5. So I've said the first awards were rendered in 2010. So after 10 years uh, of Rule 41.5 and 34 decisions or award, it's evident that many concerns that were raised in the initial stages of implementation uh, of this rule um, never really occurred. We don't have, as a matter of fact, a too high number of disputes that have been delayed by this kind of applications. Why? I think the, the, the high standard and, and the uniformity in decisions played a crucial role in promoting the Rule 41.5. On top of this, the strict timeline set in Rule 41.5 also guaranteed um, quick dismissal of filing and at the same time protected from any delay uh, stratagem. So we've got to remain cautious on this rule. But what I think can be said is that the reactions of initial scholarship about this rule were, were quite mixed. If you look at the articles published in, in the years 2006, 7, 8, to 10, um, uh, there were a lot of concerns that were raised on the rule 41.5. More recent scholarship over the last uh, two or three years consider the rule to be favorable. So here there is an evolution also when you look at the academic discourse on the rule 41.5. And in my view, this is well supported by uh, the trends uh, and the data. Um, now, it means that in a sense, and I'll conclude uh, soon on, on this uh, type of application, it means that uh, the rule evolved with the increase of decisions and awards by tribunals. We are back to this idea. There may be an increase in the number of applications, but it's concomitant to an increase in the number of disputes and cases. And that is something important, I, I think. Uh, the rule has evolved also as a result of the increase in the number of cases because many decisions, awards in these cases, basically establish the rule more solidly and reduce the fear of unwarranted summary dismissals. Now, um, it is... However, desire that states should clarify the conditions uh, required while filing for summary dismissal provision. It's possible to further refine um, the, the regime of the rule uh, 41.5. Um, such explanation may be incorporated in arbitral rules or even in investment treaties by the states themselves. Um, and on top, of this, the, on top of this, the tribunal uh, administering, uh, managing a case uh, could, could also uh, reduce the, 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 the potential misspending of the parties by laying down a string timeline at the initial phase. Now, I give you, um, you know, some justification, a factual justification that these three uh, new types of applications are on the rise, that they have the potential to cause delay in the world of arbitration. Um, what's more difficult 
is to come to a similar conclusion for each of the three applications. So my conclusion, my final remarks are going to, uh, to be very specific to each of these three applications. But first, generally, remember the point of departure for today's lecture. That was the notion of delays that are becoming a problem. So delays are becoming increasingly common and akin to a feature of investment arbitration proceedings. The notion that delays contribute to the, the fairness of the investment arbitration ecosystem is, I think, long replaced by the idea that delays are now a procedural tactic employed by parties to obtain favorable judgments in the long run. And so I'm afraid that uh, arbitration, investment arbitration today and for the coming years is likely to remain riddled with procedural disputes that can contribute to delay. Uh, the big question is not so much whether there'll be delay, but that's going to be what kind of delays and uh, how long can these delays be? Now, back to each of the, the three applications. Um, I think that um, third-party funding disclosures, uh, summary applications under the exit rules, and applications for security of cost, uh, I take them in a reverse order, sorry, uh, have become now the three uh, major and new delay mechanisms employed by parties to an investment arbitration. Um, and that can be confirmed, supported by many disputes. Now, a final empirical analysis reveals that all three of these tactics are increasingly employed and they're on the rise within investment arbitration, particularly in the last 10 years. So starting roughly in 2010. Security for costs applications um, is harmful because they can really prolong the proceedings before the hearings on uh, merit. Uh, and these are often employed or these are often deployed strategically by the respondent states when they have knowledge of the potential um, inability of claimants to bear a significant amount of proceedings costs in one instance. On the other hand, third party funding uh, by itself is not a delay tactic. It's the act of disclosure necessitated by transparency and accountability concerns in investment arbitration that is often used uh, to delay proceedings. So the respondent states may often use such disclosures to map connections, conflicts of interest with the parties or the tribunal in an attempt to further stall proceedings. And the third types of applications, so summary applications facilitated by the rule 41.5 provides for the summary procedure to dismiss claims that have a manifest lack of legal merit. Since the determination is subjective and fact specific, it can theoretically be time consuming and can require the tribunal to undertake a detailed analysis before the official commencement proceedings. And so it may become, we'll see, but it may become in the future an effective tactic to delay proceedings. Now, uh, really come to, to my final, final remarks, um, taken together, uh, these these applications, these three, these, uh, three applications threaten to various extents. They are not all the same 
they do not all, all uh, they, they do not all uh, display the same uh, danger for arbitral proceedings. So together, uh, they, they they threaten to very various extents the auspices upon which um, investment arbitration is built, notably this idea of time uh, effectiveness. The increasingly litigious nature of proceedings, while here to stay, really requires very careful re-examination by parties, uh, councils, and arbitrators alike to ensure that the process is not abused by any stakeholders. Also, while maintaining parties, while maintaining the balance between legitimate interim applications and unwanted delay tactics is intricate and, and difficult to execute. It seems to be the most pragmatic way forward for the uh, investment arbitration community. And that will be the, the last word, but investment arbitration as a concept and in practice must attempt to ensure that no stakeholders are negatively uh, prejudiced so that the claims are settled fairly and uh, equitably. That is my uh, hope. All right, I think I covered almost what I wanted to, to do in a bit more than 40 minutes, so I'll be a little longer than what I, I thought. I apologize for that. Um, of course, I could not cover and share with you all, all the different aspects of this research, but I very much look forward to your questions and all your comments on this work in progress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shays, for this inspired lecture. We're so lucky to have you share your observations and study with us. So there are already some questions in the chat box. I'll just read them out now. First is by Pamela Sterling. Um, she says that she has looked at applications for security for costs and finds that there is a huge difference in how they are applied by tribunals. What are the implications for such difference in applications? Um, so let me uh, return to the, I got a big chat box appearing here, sorry. So, which uh, um, that's the sorry that's the question on the the security for costs, correct? Sure, of course, yes. Well, that's a good one. Um, look, uh, the the quick answer. There is a long and a quick answer. The the quick answer here uh, is that not all institutional rules make a reference to such uh, securities. So, however they do provide tribunals with the power to issue interim relief. Okay, so there is the FSCT, but overall, uh, there'll be a ways for tribunals acting under different rules, the power to issue interim relief. And so while the, the approach depends on the, uh, the common law or uh, civil law heavy lineage of the tribunal, I think that these are often misused to delay proceedings. Often such applications have the impact of placing a heavy burden on the claimants at the beginning of the proceedings. That's important, which really has the potential to, uh, to discourage, to deter genuine claims due to, to their inability to deposit such security immediately and in full amount. So that's how I would answer this first question. They have uh, a related question to that. You have mentioned that the applications for security for cost is based on urgency and serious risk of harm to the applicant. Can you further explain this practice? Is it is it a right set for parties to claim the costs of the litigation? That's the last one there. Would you mind putting together two or three questions so I have the time to to, to read them or to think about the answers. Sure. So uh, again, by Pamela Sterling, there are two questions that uh, she, is she right to assume that the procedural orders are what you look at to assess and measure the delays? And also, isn't the disclosure application better regulated by the International Bar Association guidelines, which creates red, orange, and green lists? 
Um, yeah, okay. Okay, sorry, I'm playing with the, the parameters. I, I lost the video, but I got the chat. Um, so I see the questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start with the last one, if I may. Uh, on the IBA guidelines. Um, so, so that's an interesting one. Um, look, yes, it's true that the, the International Bar Association has laid down uh, guidelines to facilitate an arbitrator in determining what information must be disclosed. But its practical effects are limited uh, because these guidelines are not binding in arbitration. Of course, they are considered to be significant in terms of, of, of impact, influence, and they are highly regarded um, uh, by arbitration practitioners worldwide. Now, uh, that being said, I think it's important not to expect too much from these IBA guidelines, but to the extent they would be taken into account by a tribunal, uh, yes, um, the, the specific situations of, of conflicts are divided into uh, so red, orange, and green lists, which indicate the level of concern associated with each circumstance. Uh, so you all understand that green is going to be favorable and red is going to be problematic, but the, the waivable red list, so as opposed to the, the non-waivable um, red list of severe conflicts, basically incorporate uh, serious conflicts of interest that can only be waived if all parties are aware of the conflict and explicitly uh, consents to the arbitrator continuing to serve on the panel. And so, um, for, for starters, a, a conflict occurs when one of the parties' affiliates has an ongoing economic relationship with the arbitrator's law firm. Parties to the arbitration should be aware of the link if uh, the third party funder is providing funding to a client of the arbitrator's law firm in another case. And also, if the arbitrator owns stock in a privately owned third party funding company, another conflict um, of interest uh, may, may develop. So that's the red uh, list. Uh, and I think that in the IBA, you know, Gala, you have this orange list, very briefly on the orange list, it's also relevant because um, issues uh, arising from the orange list that may lead to conflict of interest, um, you know, must be disclosed, but they may not necessitate the arbitrator's disqualification. So, in uh, orange list situations, an arbitrator must disclose if he has, within the past three years, been appointed as arbitrator uh, on two or more occasions by an affiliate of one of the parties, right? Um, or, I think, still in the orange list, this is when, this is if the arbitrator's law firm has, within the past three years, acted um, as for an affiliate of one of the parties in an unrelated matter without the involvement of the arbitrator. So, yeah, so the, the IBA guidelines are interesting, remember, not binding, so I would be very cautious on their practical impacts, uh, and they deal with a number of conflicts. But these conflicts are likely to arise more frequently, so because of the increasing popularity of third-party funding, as well as the power and influence that the third-party funder may hold over arbitrator uh, appointments. And so, um, it's not that I want to, 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 to make a compromise, but even though these IBA guidelines are for now not so important, in my view, it may well be that they increasingly play a role in a number of disputes with uh, tribunals being more and more inclined to um, uh, to look at them. Um, 
So that was the my answer for the the IBA uh, question. And now look at the other questions. Um, uh, I see I see that there is one on the um, uh, which is am I correct to assume that the the procedural orders that I discussed um, um, are what I look at the presenter uh, to assess and measure the delays. Yeah, so that's a clarification as for the methodology that I've been following. So here I would say that overall, in practice, the time of delay uh, can be measured by the number of uh, procedural orders issued during the, the continuation of a dispute. And so based on the available public data, uh, it can be argued that any investment arbitration which lasts for more than four years is characterized by delays of some form, whatever that is, right? Um, now, what 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 I wanted to what I want to perhaps highlight further in in the paper uh, that I will develop is that. Um, um, you, you have here a, a distinction between the reasonable prolongation of the time limits and on the other hand, what I would call, allow me to say, an acceptable delay. These are two different things, right? Reasonable prolongation and an acceptable delay. Uh, that's things that, that I really want to, to further capture uh, in the paper. Um, and and you have of course this issue of bifurcation I discussed earlier, um, and then, you know thinking aloud, uh, what comes to my mind is the the Billcon case, the Billcon versus Canada case, um, because that that investment uh, disputes, which many of you might uh, have come across, um, is is a case that had some very long proceedings, and the tribunal between, if my recollection is correct, 2009 and 2019, uh, issued 23 procedural orders, okay, between jurisdiction, uh, liability, and quantum, which is uh, huge. And, and that's um, a case in which drawing the line between what's reasonable prolongation and unacceptable delay is, is quite difficult. And this is what I'll try to uh, to further address uh, in the paper. I think I see a question on ICS that I can um, uh, address a little later. I see, yeah, if I may, another question, which is, is it the right set for parties to claim the costs of the, the arbitration or the litigation? No, and I want to take that question because I can clarify a few things. Um, no, in fact, party to uh, an arbitration, to an inter arbitration, shall have the um, uh, shall not have the the instantaneous right to claim any arbitration costs. Okay, this is what described in say Article thirty seven one of the the ICC uh, rules. Um, in fact. Such interventions, whatever their description may be, include awards or directions given for the purpose of maintaining the status quo and preserving a party from harm during the proceedings. Okay, this is the, the idea. So generally, interim remedies are accessible either from the national court or from uh, an arbitral tribunal. However, Let's be clear about that. The type of interim relief that a tribunal may grant in arbitration has generated huge debate over the past years, uh, particularly when it comes to the, the arbitral tribunal's power or lack of power to order security for costs. Uh, so over the, the years, the, the probability, if I may say, of success of such an application has gradually improved. And you have some very 
interesting statistics on that question published by the, the London Court of uh, International Arbitration. Um, I see perhaps um, another question. This is a very good question. I would love to to have more time to uh, to discuss this uh, on the the ICS uh, system. So I think it's a question from uh, me, so Mr. Shah. How do you think the new investment court system by the EU is in its new treaties will solve the issue of such dilatory problems? So that's a great question. Um, which I want to, to, to answer in a, in a cautious manner. It's very tempting to say that the ICS could be something that solve all, the, all these problems. It's very tempting because uh, when you look at the, the recent uh, EU treaties with Vietnam, uh, Canada, well, you observe that the, 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 the design of the ICS is very sophisticated. And so there are many uh, rules and very clear rules that organize the investment proceedings in that new context. But we've got to be cautious. First of all, um, there is not for now any court uh, probably established under either CETA, under the Canada EU or EU Vietnam FTA. And so we, we do not have even need any practice in this respect. All right. And all of you will understand that we have to be cautious. Things can be, can look very good on paper. Uh, the day there is a practice, things can deviate, can vary uh, quite a lot. Now, my view on the ICS is that, of course, it's a far more sophisticated system than what we have in the world of investment arbitration, strictly understood. Um, but it means that there is um, a risk which is very, very reduced to have the delay tactics um, under ICS. And so that's a very important selling point for this new system promoted by the EU. But there'll be here and there uh, some possible applications uh, that still allow parties to, to delay proceedings. I don't think that the ICS as such, there'll be a lot of things to see, a lot of things to cover. Um, I wouldn't say that the ICS as such is the end of any form of delay tactics, okay? Um, lawyers can be and are very creative. Uh, new rules and even stricter rules may lead in fact to new types of delay tactics um, in the course of investments arbitration or litigation in the context of the ICS. So there's also a connected question in the Q&A session. Uh, in the Q&A section, uh, it's by Pushkar Keshwamurthy. Um, it says, what is the role that administrating institutions like ICS, ID, SCC, and ICC should undertake to mitigate such tactics? Right, it's a good question. Here, I think the the role of the institutions um, got to be limited. Or well, you have two different roles. You have one role, which is to uh, to to observe the practice, to document the practice, so as to allow in due course some revisions of the rules, so the institutions do not have. Uh, the duty to, to revise the rules, to modify them, but I think very important that they uh, provide data. Uh, I think I, I, did not that, I did not discuss this today, but many of you will know that in the, the world of investment arbitration, we don't always have access to all the applications, not even to all the decisions. And that's a problem because if you do not have the decision, so you don't have the, the orders, of course, you, you are not to help out of the applications, and that may have an impact on the, the reflections or the analysis we try to conduct on this application. So, number one, institutions should do uh, always more to document the, the, the management of the proceedings. Um, and number two, 
um, they should encourage the parties in the course of the proceedings, of course, not to to abuse of this kind of tactics. And, and that allows me, you know, to make a, a link perhaps to another question that is in the chat box. One of you was asking about the code of ethics. I think institutions are really in the position to, to keep reminding um, the parties to uh, respect as much as possible these codes of ethics. And so not to use and abuse of delay tactics, so not to misuse um, procedural applications. But as such, uh, institutions do not have the power, and I don't think that they should be entitled to intervene in order to screen some of the applications. It's not their role at all. That's arbitration. So that's the that's up to the parties to to agree on you know how much flexibility and applications they want to allow and how much they want the tribunal to screen these kind of applications. I think that's all the questions that we have today. So and, uh, I would just like before to... you say thanks, let me just uh, say to Professor Chase that it was an excellent lecture, not just on the substance, but also on how to do good research. Uh, so uh, I think that that's the model which many people, many students and researchers which have joined today can follow. Uh, on that note, sir, I, I also had one question. Uh, you were talking about 41 five applications. So whether there is a relationship between 41 five application and settlement offers by the party against whom that application has been decided. Can any interconnection be made between these two? Are there any researches in this regard? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very good um, uh, point, Chirag. I think um, it's not something I've been uh, looking at, but I'm very much willing to further explore that question. Uh, could be the object of a separate paper almost, but I sense that there is also a, a potential here. Um, certainly not a correlation, but I wouldn't be surprised to find some uh, convergence in, in the use of these uh, measures. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anushka, please proceed. Okay, I would just like to thank everybody for this fruitful session. In particular, I would like to thank Dr. Julian Chase for taking the time to join us here and share his knowledge with us. I would also like to thank our Vice Chancellor and Patron, Dr. Dilip Uke, and our convener, of course, Mr. Chirag Balyan. And I would also like to thank all our participants here today for being so wonderful and engaging. We hope to see you all here again at our next session. Thank you so much for joining and have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the great questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care all. Keep well and healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.